to us every single day. But, but if we don't stand still, we're going to miss the voice of God. going to waste that time. The God of this universe is inviting you into his home. And hey, bring everybody with you. Bring as many friends as you possibly can. I want you to come. I want you to be in my house. have been made whole in Jesus Christ and sin no longer is your master and today can be the start of a whole new season where we are receiving the freedom offered in Jesus Christ he is going to hold to his word but he also gives us discipline common sense resources intellect drive and he wants us to partner with him in the story Defining greatness by fame, rich, power, all that stuff. They're defining greatness by taking stars, opening up, letting people see them and say, wow, and you still believe? You still have hope? You still forgive that person? There must be a God. When the world cries out and says, where is God? That is not an indictment on God. It is an indictment on the church, the image bearers. May people see God when they see you. Christ is in you. Welcome to Alliance Church. My name is Chris. I am one of the pastors here, and 
We are ex glad you are with us here this morning. What you just saw was the week recap of Life 2022. We will be having our Life Recap service next Sunday here at Alliance Church at 9.30 a.m. You're going to hear from a number of our students, and it's going to be a great time. So we encourage you to come and see what the Lord was up to down in Orlando, Florida with our Life team this year. There's a couple of other announcements that I have for you this week. Um, by the way, those students who are on our life team, if for some reason you've forgotten for all of the reminders that have been sent out, our debrief is today following service over in the youth house. So um, be there for that. And uh, we've got a couple of other things coming up this week. Soccer camp is here. It starts tomorrow. It's going to be out at Bell Prairie Sports Complex from 4 to 6 p.m. That's our Alliance Youth Run planned everything uh, soccer camp for incoming third through fifth graders. Be in prayer for that this week. Um, we don't know how many students that we're going to have this year. This is an adaptation of the camp that our missions team uh, that went to Providence, Rhode Island put on last year and we're bringing it here to Little Falls and we are excited to see what the Lord's going to do. But we don't know how many students we're going to have. Right now we've got 13 student volunteers who are going to be facilitating and run running that camp over the next four days. So be in prayer for them. Uh, be in prayer for our leadership. We'd sure appreciate that. Also with that said, as a way and an opportunity for us to bless those families who are coming to that camp, Pastor Ryan sent out an email last week. There is going to be a community meal that's put on at Bell Prairie Soccer Fields on Thursday. It's going to start at 6 o'clock p.m. It's going to be after our final camp. We're going to be grilling some stuff out and doing things of that nature. There is a need for volunteers, adult volunteers, to help with that because our student volunteers are going to be running the actual camp. You can talk to Pastor Ryan if you feel like you would like to partner with us in that initiative on Thursday. Um, tomorrow is Ruby's Pantry, which is another great ministry we have here at Alliance Church. So, and uh, that's going to be up at the, the new building near the Fleet Supply Building location. Uh, volunteers can arrive at 2.30 p.m. Registration and distribution starts at 4.30 and then next Sunday, we want to be able to celebrate as a church. We are having our baptism Sunday and our church picnic. It's going to be at the Thomas's residence. That address is listed here in the bulletin. That's going to start after service. So we need some help for that too because we have to bring tables and chairs and all sorts of stuff like that and get it set up after service. So if you feel like you've got some muscles and you want to assist with that setup for that church picnic, that's going to be happening next Sunday after service. You can talk to Pastor Ryan or myself and we can get you plugged in with that. Also, with that said, this is an opportunity for us as a church. If you've never taken the step of faith that is following our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the waters of baptism, we encourage you to do that this upcoming Sunday. When I talk to students about this, um, I typically ask them, why not now? Why wait? We talk so much about surrender and entering into the deeper life and all these different things and, and following the Lord in obedience on, on a regular basis. And this is something that in the church we sometimes just kind of think, you know, oh, I, I, I don't necessarily need to think about that or, or do that. I'm saved. And that's true. We are saved. And yet we desire to follow the example of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in whatever we do, no matter the ask, no matter the cost. And one of the things that he tells the church is to go to make disciples of all nations and to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And the scriptural examples that we see are of belief and of baptism. And if you've never taken that step, why not now? Talk to Pastor Ryan, talk to myself. It's an awesome opportunity for you to step up and stand in solidarity with the church of Jesus Christ that exists here on this earth and says, I believe in the Christ. What an opportunity for us to glorify God in that way. And for him to look down as he looked down upon his son Jesus and say, this is my son, this is my daughter in whom I am well pleased. So if you're considering that at all, if you've been wrestling with that, we encourage you to take that step, step out in faith. Why not now? That will be a celebration in the center of the bulletin there on that center panel. Um, there's some information there. We will have a meal uh, we encourage you to please bring something to share if you are able. Chips, dessert, salad, fruit. It's going to be a great time of fellowship. Would you bow your heads and pray with me this morning? Jesus, prepare our hearts for worship right now. Prepare our hearts to be still. Prepare our hearts to experience the joy 
of the presence of your spirit. I pray, Father God, that you would fill this place. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for who you are to us. Thank you for who you are to the world. Thank you, Jesus, for being so close, for being so personal, for being so loving. We praise you for that, Lord. In this world that's broken, in this world that needs hope, Jesus, you are that hope. And we praise you for that, and we thank you for that, Lord. Provide hope to those of us in this room this morning. Help us to see you, Jesus, maybe in a new light. Help us to draw near to you. Help us to experience the full weight, the full burden, and yet the full glory of the cross. You are the Christ, Father. Thank you for pursuing us relentlessly. In Jesus' name, we lift this time of worship up to you. Amen. Hey, church, glad you're here this morning. Let's stand and sing a couple songs together. Uh, we're going to sing, first of all, Build My Life. Pick up where we left off last week. Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in one. And show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes. And show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me
This next song we're going to sing is actually a, a mashup of two different songs. The song Gratitude, uh, we introduced that back on Easter, and then the song All Things New. So just follow me. It's going to be a little bit different than we're used to singing, but I think you'll catch on. I've got nothing new with what I express all my gratitude. I could sing these songs as I often do. Every song must end. Just one move with my arms stretched wide. I will worship. Praise you again and again. Cause 
Lord, as we finish up this book, this letter to the Galatians, I ask that your spirit will be with us. I ask that you will reveal to us truths of who you are, the truth of your gospel, the truth of your cross this morning. And Lord, I just ask that you help us to see clearly maybe ways that you're needing and wanting to transform us our minds, our hearts, our souls. Lord, do a work. This gospel is incredible. We will see that again this morning, what it is that Christ has done, and may that be the center of our focus day after day. For your glory we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and grab a seat this morning. A number of weeks ago, we've watched the show before. We don't get a lot of television at home, so we were up visiting my parents up at their cabin, and my brother and his two boys were there, and we were watching this show. It's called something along the lines of Brain Games. You've ever seen the show, Brain Games? It's, it's really, it's, it's interesting, but one of the, the, the basic premises of the show is to demonstrate how the brain works. And for some of us, we look at that, it's like, well, that's really over my head, okay? However, it was interesting and fascinating on how and they do some experiments, like some of the shows in the past, they'll do experiments on people, uh, like sleep deprivation. So they'll make them go days without sleep and just see how they react, which is pretty comical, really, when they can't think straight anymore. It's just, it's, it's actually pretty humorous. But the specific show that we were watching had to do with mankind's, people's propensity to be deceived. And so one of the experiments that they had, and it was just interesting, so they had this table set up, and they got these volunteers at this, at this table, and they'd come in and they'd sit at the table, and then they would place one hand on the table, the other hand is on the table, but then they had this board in between there, and then they laid out this rubber hand, so it looked like, as the person sitting here, this is tall enough so they can't see their own hand, and so they had their left hand here, and they had their right hand back here, but it looked like they had another right hand there, okay? I know, that's funny in, in itself, and it was rubber, and they took a brush, and they just started brushing the hand, just gently brushing the hand, and they would ask, well, can you feel that? And then eventually it's like, wow, I, I think I kind of can. It's, they have a name for it. It doesn't mean I remember the name, but it's something like sympathetic you know, pain or something like that. So as they're, as they're sitting there watching, it's like, wow, that's really cool. I can kind of feel that. And then the person who's sitting on this side of the table who's brushing their hand reaches below, grabs a hammer, and whacks the hand. <laughs> it's like the people's face. Like, <gasps> you know, and they, they have this moment where there's actually some brief pain that they kind of feel. They don't have the real pain, but the brain kind of sends that message. It's like, whoa, that just hurt, but it really didn't. And it really did a nice job of kind of demonstrating the reality that as human beings, we are actually pretty easily deceived. And there's psychology, and I'm not getting into that aspect of it, but the scriptures also speak towards this picture of deception. We looked at one of those pictures last week. And when we consider ourselves do you think you're deceived? You know, for the most part, I think I have a pretty good perception of what's going on. But I think there's probably a lot more deception going on in my mind than I ever even realized. I shared the story in the, in the email. And this is just one example, and it was a, a story of my life when I was in college. I was in biblical perspective, or not perspective, biblical, the, the principles of biblical interpretation. That was the name of the class. And the, the professor, he was a, a young guy, he was a doctor, his dad actually was the president of the college, whatever that means, okay. But he, he knew his stuff, and in doing so, we're taking this class, we have readings to do each, after each class, and so we'd come back and then he would quiz us. It was kind of that same way every time, he'd quiz us on the reading, it was a one question quiz, either you get it right or you get it wrong. And the idea was there is no other questions to bank on, you have one question, you get that question wrong, you get a zero, if you get it right, you get the point, all right? 
And so there's a lot, his, his motive was so that you read the chapter. Well, I didn't read the chapter. I should have read the chapter. I, it was a true and false question, 50-50 chance. And he asked the question. He says, true or false? The Bible contains the actual words of Christ. It's like, wow, that's got to be true. And so I, I was ready there to, to write down true. And it's like, wait a minute, that just seems too obvious. That, that can't be the right answer because he's, no. That, but yet I could not bring myself to write anything but true because I had been so set on, I've got the words. They're even written in red in my version, the actual words of Christ. And so I wrote the word true on my paper and I handed it in. And then he asked the class and he says, so what is it? Is it true or is it false? And the class all says, true, like the vast majority. And then the, the five that read the chapter said, false. And he said, it's false. And I remember going like, wait, what in the world? This just kind of shocked me into how can you say that? Are you even, this is a Christian school, you know. And how can you be teaching such things as a, as a professor in a Christian school, Christian Missionary Alliance school? And he ends up saying that, well, the New Testament was written in Greek, and Jesus spoke Aramaic. So it's impossible that the Bible contains the actual words of Jesus Christ. And then my Hmong friend, Vu Yang, I'm kidding you not, that was his name, okay. My Hmong friend, Vu Yang, he, he cried out aloud, that's a trick question! And my, the professor says, uh, this is college. But there was a deception. And he wasn't deceiving me. The professor wasn't, goal wasn't to deceive me. But there's a propensity that I had, even in that moment, to believe something that wasn't true. Did this diminish the truth of the scriptures? Absolutely not. No way. And yet it, it, it forced me in a very good way to look at what is really true. It's impossible that your English Bible contains the actual words that Jesus spoke. That would be true unless... The book was actually written in the language that Jesus spoke. We still hold in the alliance, don't, mis don't misunderstand. I, we believe fully in the inerrancy of Scripture. I am all on board with the inerrancy of Scripture. We just have to understand what that exactly means. The point of it is, it's easy to be deceived. We fall into a certain belief patterns. We think, that, well, because I believe this, then it should be true. How often have we thought, if everyone thought like I did, this world would be a whole lot easier to live in, wouldn't it? And yet the reality of it is nobody thinks like you do. Every one of us is a little bit different and unique, and that's all the more reason why we have to be careful when it looks at deception. Just because what I believe to be true doesn't make it true. Just because of what you believe to be true doesn't make it true. But yet there is a truth, and it's God's way, whether I fully comprehend or understand what he's saying or not, does not diminish the truth of God, and we hold to that truth. I may have, you know, I, my goal isn't to create questions and uncertainty. My goal is to actually understand, help you understand the beauty of the truth of Scripture, and that's what we're looking at. What is the truth of God? Not what is what I want it to say, not what is what I want it to believe, but what is God's truth that he wants us to understand and to believe. And so with this idea of this deception, what is it? Say it out loud, what is it? Albatross. Thank you, Pam. I was looking for something a little bit more basic, but that's fine. Okay. <laughs> what is it? What's it a picture of? The duck. Okay. A rabbit. Wait a minute. It's too great gravy. What are we going to do here? You see one thing. I see another. I, I heard Derek said it's a duck. I heard Eric say it's a rabbit. Oh, well, let's both be right. Right? It's a rabbit and a duck? That can't be the case. Have you ever seen a rabbit and a duck that's the same creature? It's impossible. This, again, is the point. We can argue till the cows come home about whether it's a rabbit or a duck. And we can come to this reality. It's an albatross. We just learned that. <clears throat> I had no idea. We can come to this reality that this is something, but what you think it is, doesn't make it that. Okay, what if I said that? It's a bunny. Okay, that's just what I said. But let's say whoever drew this initially says it's a bunny. Whether you see it as a duck or whether you see it as a bunny is irrelevant. Now the power lies in who it was that created it. Do you follow? 
You, you catch that? Then this is big truth. This is a reality that we have to grasp and understand. This is the point of this was to show how easily we can be deceived because you can see both things there. What about this? You've heard this old the blind mice story. These aren't mice. These are men. You got all these guys, they're, they're blindfolded and they're looking at this elephant without being able to see it and they're feeling around trying to de- depict what is this that I am touching? And one guy down here, the only one in the, uh, the non-white coat, the red, it's a tree holding the leg. And one holds the trunk and thinks it's a snake, one thinks it's a spear because of the different parts of the elephant. Are they all right? Not really. They like to hold the truth that they're right and argue the fact that they're right, but what is the reality? Well, it's an elephant. Just because what they believe, they've been deceived, whatever they believe, they think it's true. Does that make it true? No. What does make it true? What God says. And that is what makes it true. One more. This was an interesting experiment that I read this last week. So they took wine experts, not experts in child rearing when listening to children wine. That's the wrong kind of wine. This was actually a wine that you drink. Wine expert. They brought in experts. Wine people. I'm not one of those experts, okay? But they brought in experts. Apparently, wine experts are, are very elite when it comes to taste and can understand different flavors or whatever the case is. So they, they did this experiment. It's a wonderful experiment. They gave them a glass of red wine, a glass of white wine, and they said, we want you to taste each wine and then describe the wine to us. And so they tasted the white wine, and the, they used words like, oh, it's, it's, it's light, you know, it's, it's airy, it's, it's fruity, it's citrus, and some of those types of words to describe the white wine. And then they asked, well, now would you describe the red wine for us? And they used words like, oh, it's rich, and it's deep, and it's musky, and it's, it's almost kind of a, a dark red fruit flavor. And, and, and to their chagrin, they came to reveal to these wine experts, both wines were identical, one just had food coloring in it. Okay? You just you catch how easily, these are experts, how easily we are deceived. My goal isn't to crush us, oh man, I can't believe anything, I can't trust anything, because that's exactly what Rene Descartes fell for. You know who Rene Descartes was? A great French philosopher. Philosophers like these in the past, I had a class in college that was philosophy. It was actually at Fergus Falls Community College. It was a secular college that was teaching it. Uh, not that that makes a whole lot of difference. It's just a little bit of a different perspective than at a Christian college. But it was interesting. So he's talking about philosophy and all of these wonderful philosophers. Well, what, here's the fascinating thing with Rene Descartes. I don't know if you've studied him at all. He was this guy, and he had a good intention. He wanted to figure out how he could know really what was true. That was his initiative. I want to find out what's true. And so he kind of just kept processing these thoughts and these challenges. And and like, how can I know that that what I'm seeing is true? How can I know that what I'm hearing is true? And so that's what he's measuring off of everything. And he came up with this conclusion. I have to doubt everything. If I see you, I don't even know that you're really there unless I can touch you. Well, then if I touch you, maybe my fingers are deceiving me. Maybe I can't trust my hands or what I'm feeling. Maybe this is all some kind of a crazy dream. And this is what he came up with. His final conclusion, this is the only thing that I can really prove that's true. This is Rene Descartes. I think, therefore I must be. That's what he came up with. Ironically, what's not, that's, he's well known for that. What's ir- ir- ironic and not as well known is he actually started to doubt this very statement. And he came up with all he could prove that was true, period, in the whole world around him, was I think. That was it. I'm sorry, you just wasted your life, okay? (laughs) Just call it what it is. It's like that was a lot of work for a whole lot of nothing. But what I want to see is here is this Rene Descartes and his thinking and his philosophy, though he had good intentions, he came to realize really a truth that we find in the scriptures that it's easy to be deceived. And so he struggled to find what can I trust in? What is really true? And that's where we kind of touched on just briefly last week and what I want to kind of rebound in here too. Paul points out of this fact, he challenges us. He says, I don't want you to be deceived. These Galatians, we're wrapping up this book of Galatians today. And I'm excited for it because there's a really a powerful message here in these last few verses and it kind of ties everything in. But Paul, as he's addressing these Galatians, they've been deceived in a number of ways. We're going to look at that today. You've got false teachers. They've been deceived, and they're deceiving others. You've got Galatian people, Gentile people, and they are in the process of being deceived, and Paul's calling them out and saying, hey, I want you to understand the truth of this message. I don't want you to be deceived. 
I want you to know and understand that there is a truth and you can hold on to that truth and that truth is solid and it's good. And so that's what we're going to look at. Back in the Old Testament, we find in Jeremiah 17, God points to this reality that Paul's also revealing to us today. Uh, God points through the prophet Jeremiah, he says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Just, you have the natural propensity to be deceived. We easily fall into, whether it's truths and beliefs or false beliefs and things like that, but we come to realize and believe that maybe if my life was just a little bit different, then I could find this peace and this happiness I'm looking for. Maybe if I just earned a little bit more money, maybe that's what it would take, okay? Man, if I could just, if I could just invest my money in such a way that I could find you know, this bigger home, you know, maybe that, that home that has the, the shop. Um, the grass is always greener. And boy, if I could just figure out a way to, to get my lawn to look like my neighbor's house. If I could just figure out a way that everyone would think like I do and we could actually elect the right person into office, then maybe our country would be better. These are deceptions. And we, we easily fall into these patterns and these deceptions. And I, Paul's going to point out to us, he says, there is something bigger going on here than just the beliefs that you're falling into and the Galatians and their, and their beliefs in particular was that they could somehow earn God's acceptance and they were deceived for it. But this is not a new concept, okay? Galatians 6, we looked at this last week. And we just glanced over it. So we're going to kind of look at this one and then we're going to pull this one into the rest of this, this book of the Bible, the rest of this chapter as we wrap it up today. Paul says, don't be deceived. And then he follows that statement up. So it's easy to just say, don't be deceived. In other words, follow the truth, know the truth, follow the truth, believe in the truth. And then he follows it up and says, God cannot be mocked. In other words, it doesn't matter what you believe. You can believe that, hey, I believe in Jesus Christ. I'm good. I'm going to go live the way I want to live, and it's going to be fine because, you know, I've accepted Christ. I said the prayer. And now Paul is saying, don't deceive yourself. There's a truth out there. There is a God out there, whether you acknowledge him or not, whether you believe that you can earn it or not. It doesn't change the reality of those truths. What Paul is saying is don't be deceived. God is God. God is truth. It doesn't matter what you say about him, think about him, act about him. It doesn't change who he is. And so you ought to consider who is this God hold on to that truth and let that be what affects your life. Do you, do you see that pattern? I really think that's what Paul is getting at here when he says, don't be deceived. You can't pretend that you're a Christian and then go and live however you want to live, claiming the name of Christ, but re- where's your evidence? And it's not, I'm not talking about actions. I'm talking about walking and living by the Spirit as we've been talking about. That's what Paul is calling them out on. He's, telling to, he's talking to the Judaizers. He's talking to the Galatians. Don't be deceived thinking that you can somehow do enough to earn God. That is not grace. That's mocking who God is. That's mocking the cross. It's mocking the work of Jesus Christ. You will reap what you sow. So if, if you have your eyes focused on your own self, if you have your eyes focused on your finances, if you have your eyes focused on your own achievements, it's striking to me how much I care about winning and losing. I hate that about me. I can't stand it. And yet it seems like I can't get a handle on it sometimes. There's certain things I avoid. I've talked about this before. I don't play foosball because I hate losing foosball. It's stupid. I mean, it's just, is there anything less important? But somehow we come to believe that that's where I build up and earn this value. I'll tell you what that is. That's a, that's a deception. There might have, I have no value. Whether I think I do is one thing. Any real, I have no value in my accomplishments. That's a mockery when I say, this now has earned me value. That's what Paul's getting at here. We looked at a different portion of Psalm 139, but this, this reflects on how God knows. Okay? He can't be mocked. You can't keep secrets from God. He knows it. Okay? You can't say, oh, I'm a follower of Christ, and then you go off and you live and indulge in the acts of the flesh. We had that a few weeks ago without him knowing it. He knows full well. And so the psalmist writes in Psalm 139, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. 
See if there's any offensive way in me. In other words, is there, is there something that I'm not seeing? Is there some way that I'm deceiving myself and lead me into the way of everlasting? That's the heart of someone who has their heart after God's own heart, but who recognizes their own propensity to be deceived. 1 Corinthians 13. For now I see, for, excuse me, for now we see only reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Everything that you have right now, everything that you see, even, even our images of who we think God is, it's nothing but kind of this foggy mirror. But there's going to come a day where we're going to see this truth for what it is, and we're going to see it clearly, and it's going to leave us falling on the floor with our jaws open, going, oh my God, I had no idea. I feel like in my life I have moments where I can see this glimpse of God's holiness. But for the most part, even those are just a foggy image of who this holy God really is. And when I come to see without the deception of my eyes and my mind and my heart and my soul, without the deception of that for who God, for who he really is, I will, I'm convinced that I'll be flat on my face before God going, oh my God, I had no idea you were this holy. And that's an okay thing. That's an okay place to be. That's an okay place to anticipate. But we have to recognize that in this world, even up until that point, we are easily deceived. And so what we find is <clears throat> you got plans for the day, you know, you got plans for the weekend. I know this one's almost over. You got this coming week. Um, family and I, we got plans in a couple of weeks to go, you know, on vacation. We have these plans. So we live in a way that is Really, and I, this is not a criticism, don't misunderstand, this is okay, but I want you to understand the bigger picture that's going on here. If you think that you've got tomorrow, oh yeah, the, tomorrow I'm going to do this, tomorrow I'm going to do this, tomorrow I'm going to do this, okay, that's the Lord willing. You know, the, the Muslims have a phrase for that, it's called inshallah, if the Lord wills. But the idea of it is, okay, you're not guaranteed to make it home today. We say that kind of stuff, but we really don't believe it. You follow? You're not guaranteed tomorrow. Tomorrow's Ruby's Pantry. Guess what? That whole building could explode and we won't be having Ruby's Pantry tomorrow. Okay, sorry, Gary. <laughs> Gary's going like, whoo, that could be a problem. Okay? But just, just understand, is it likely? No. But there's a reality. We live in such a way where we feel that it's guaranteed and yet it's not guaranteed. That's a, just a form of the picture of deception. And that's really what we get at when we get into verse 10. This is what Paul's saying, therefore... As we have opportunity, in other words, your life is limited. Here you are. This is your opportunity. It's not, your opportunity is not going to last forever. You don't know how long you have. This is not a guilt trip. This is just a per perspective picture, okay? Let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong in the family of believers. In other words, you've got a conflict. We talked about this last week. Conflict with someone else in the church. Oh, I'll deal with that in a couple weeks. There's no guarantee that you have that. Do you hear that? While you have the opportunity... Live by the Spirit. There's going to come a day it's going to be over. Don't know what that'll look like. It's going to be crazy. I know that much. So then we step into the remaining verses of chapter 6. And this is going to be exciting. We're going to look at verse 11 here. We're going to do a little bit of a describing on this one. Verses 12 and 13, we're going to find Paul's going to actually point back to some of the phrases that they are also already used in regards to who these false teachers were. And then verse 14 really hits, a, hits us with a punch. And then 15, 16, and 17, and 18, we're really going to kind of wrap it up at the end. <clears throat> but he says, so this is typical, actually, of a lot of New Testament letters. Thousands of letters are looked at from New Testament time, not necessarily the New Testament. And in these letters that have been studied, not all scriptural letters, this is found in most of them a pattern that we find. So what a author of a letter would do is he would dictate to a scribe, someone who was actually skilled in writing, and they would write it down. This, you know, you go to school here in our culture, most people know how to, how to read and write, and most of you have neater handwriting than I do. Okay, so I could call on any one of you to, hey, I want to dictate a letter to you and you will write it down for me as I give it to you. This was the pattern that was included. This fits that pattern, this letter to the Galatians, it fits that pattern. But then most of those letters then would include right at the end during that conclusion where the actual author would take the pen and begin to recap and emphasize some of those aspects of the letter. That's what we have here. There's two reasons really for that. One is it demonstrated the authenticity of where that letter came from. So by Paul doing this, this would fit with this reality. Hey, this is Paul. 
uh, recognize his great big letters. Right? We'll talk about that in a second here too. And the other aspect is it points back to the validity of the message that was just given. In other words, when Paul takes the pen, he's basically saying, hey, I am Paul, I am the apostle, and everything that you've read that the scribe wrote for me, I hold it to it. It came from me. And so he's going to recap some of those things. And so that's really what we find here in verse 11. And then there's different, there's uh, arguments on what Paul means when he says, see what large letters I use. There's really two two uh, versions or two ideas of thought on this. One, the people believe that Paul had poor eyesight and so he had to write just to be able to see that big. That could be true. There's people that very adamantly argue that reality. Could be, don't know. The other is that he was writing for such strong emphasis. Again, there's people that hold very strongly to that view. And you have two people that are viewing, are they both right? I suppose maybe. Does it matter? Not really. What's the bigger picture? It's the message in there. What's the truth that we're after? It's the message that we're in there. And we're deceived if I'm going to start arguing over, well, I know why that was. It was because Paul had bad eyesight. Really? Do you know that? Did you know Paul? Did you ask him as to why that was? Do you follow? It's easy to fall into some deceptions in that way. I'm pointing that out again here as well. So that's verse 11. Then verse 12. <clears throat> so what Paul's going to do here is he's actually going to give us three recap, three motives that was really driving those false teachers throughout the book of Galatians. Three motives that we're going to find. But he writes, he says, those who want to impress people by means of the flesh are trying to compel you to be circumcised. In other words, you have these people, this group of people, all they're really trying to do is impress people. They're not interested in the cross. They're not interested in Christ. They're not interested in grace. They're interested in their own accolades. They're interested in their own building up of worth. They want to be valuable, and this is one way that they're going to do it, to gain some sense of value with themselves or even others around them. So those who want to impress people by the means of the flesh are trying to compel you to be circumcised. So that's the, the first one is basically it's, it's an obsession for outward uniformity. Their emphasis is basically on how things look. They want you to see how it is that they look. They want you to see their clean and polished outside surfaces, even though their insides are maybe secret and dying. Don't be deceived. God will not be mocked. God knows exactly what's on the inside. And for some of us, that scares us to death. Okay? I'll be honest. And look at that. God knows what's on the inside. Say, oh, that is filthy. And that's where it's going to help us to understand when we come to the beauty of the cross here in just a moment. You know, it's interesting, we look at Christianity, and we can, we can act like a Christian till the cows come home. But acting Christian can often bring what can often be what conceals our proud and unrepentant hearts. You follow that? We can, oh, I'm a Christian, and so i got to work hard to act like a Christian. And when I act like a Christian, what it actually can be doing is I'm trying to actually hide what is going on on the inside, which is pride and unrepentance, And that's what I think Paul is saying. Don't be deceived. Don't hide what's going on on the inside. God already knows it. We read that in Psalm 139. So there's a, excuse me, there's a second, there's a second motive that we find here in the false teachers. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. And so in other words, these false teachers not only are looking to build up their value and their outward appearance, but they're also then trying to avoid pain and persecution. So in the Jewish churches, in that the Jewish synagogues, if they said, oh, don't worry about it, you don't need to be circumcised, they have persecution coming at them from their own people, the Jews would then be coming down on them. It's like, whoa, no, no, I don't want that kind of persecution. I'd rather conform to whatever it is that you're laying out, you know, okay, let's just, fine, circumcision is fine, let's go ahead and go with that one. And so they're avoiding the persecution from others by holding to false doctrine. So that's the second motive. That's what's going on. They want to look good. And number two is they want to avoid the pain, okay? There's a third one that we find here in, in verse 13. And it says, not even those who are circumcised keep the law, yet they want you to be circumcised, that they may boast about your circumcision in the flesh. And it's, it's really their national identity is really what they're, they're finding. They're, they claim to obey the law, yet they cannot obey the law themselves. It's interesting. I had the thought, 
And this isn't a, it's not a criticism of my past. It's not a criticism, criticism of the influences of those who influenced me in the past. But I remember in high school, I went to what was called a Sun Life Evangelism Missions Project. Sun Life was a, an organization. Again, I'm not bad-mouthing Sun Life whatsoever. It, it served a great purpose. But we went to this Evangelism Missions Project. It was a basically evangelism training. I was in high school, just before my senior year. It was out in Seattle, Washington. And so myself, along with a group from our, our youth group, we drove out, and I drove with my youth pastor, and he had, he really shouldn't have been driving a group of teenagers. Not that he was a bad driver, but he, he was more unorganized than I am. And so we went without hotel reservations and such, and so we had no place to stay. We ended up staying in the, in, in the van. We had pizzas that were open and rotting, whatever the case is. It just was a disaster. Uh, it's funny, good stories in that sense. He couldn't stay awake, and as we're driving, he's pretending like he's shooting bugs, you know, as they're hitting the windshield. It's just like, okay, pull over. This is not safe. Um, anyway, <clears throat> that's not the point of the story. Point of the story, so we're, we're in these classes, and in these classes, you're, you're getting good content, you're understanding apologetics. You're understanding why you believe what you believe. And then we would go and we would do what's called street evangelism. And so we'd go into different areas of, of Seattle. And again, don't, don't misunderstand my heart on this. There was a lot of good aspects that took place here. But I remember a moment when we came back. We would come back after going out into the streets. We'd come back and we would report together. So the whole team would report. And I remember how I felt. So this is on, on me, not anyone else. I just I really want to be clear on that because I don't want to be criticizing anyone else here. But we heard these reports, and there was one group that would come back and they would talk about, oh, man, we led 18 people to Christ. It's like, wow. That was really good. I felt like I had two conversations, you know. And another group would come back, oh, wow, we've, we've got 32 people we led to Christ. And in my group, I'm thinking, like, man, I'm so worthless. What in the world? We didn't do, and maybe we had one or two. I'll tell you that. If we had one or two, I don't remember their names. This, I just want to be careful. I want you to hear, this is what I, this is what came to mind when I looked at this. Because the picture is not even those who are circumcised, et cetera, et cetera, but good, look at this. Yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your circumcision in the flesh. Oh, Lord, help us. Be very careful with this. We are called to evangelize. We are called to share this gospel. Don't diminish that. Yet, if I somehow build my value on how many people have come to Christ because of the words that I have said, woe is me or woe unto me. That is a big deal. That is taking pride and boasting in my own accolades as if I had something to do with salvation of someone else. Uh-uh. Huh. I'll tell you what, sorry, I have no power to save you. Nothing, no one. No, I can't save any one of you. But Jesus Christ can, and he does. And that's the message, and that's what we're going to see here in the next verse. This is so important. Yes, we have roles. We're called to obey the Spirit. If the Spirit leads me to have a conversation with someone, I should have that conversation with someone. If the Spirit leads me to have that, sharing that gospel, hey, let me tell you what Jesus Christ did in my life, absolutely I obey that. But if I do this as somehow another feather in my cap, I've missed it. I have been deceived, and I'm deceiving others. That's a big deal. And then Paul takes us to verse 14. Mm. I, I sat and read on this one over and over again this week. Not because I didn't understand it, but because I found it. There's such power right here. He says, may I boast, or excuse me, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do we need another verse right now? May I never boast. <laughs> Let me tell you how good of a foosball player I really am. <laughs> I haven't lost since 1998. I haven't played since 1998. <laughs> Pretty much true. Oh, I took it so badly. What in the world do I have to boast in? That's just a bunch of garbage. This, the cross of Christ... You know what Paul gets at here? And this is what it just, it, it astounded me as I looked at this. Paul says, may I never boast in anything except for the cross of Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. You know what Paul is saying is, the cross is absolutely everything. The cross is sweet. The cross is also repugnant. 
And here's, the, here's what I mean by that. When I come to see the cross, when I come and I, I look at the cross, I can't help really but see my own filth that Jesus Christ took on that cross, and I should be repulsed by it. And in that same moment, when I look at the cross, he has taken that repugnance away from me. He took it upon himself, and I'm left with like, I didn't deserve that. And there's this overwhelming sweetness. If you haven't experienced the repugnant nature of the cross or the sweetness of the cross, or both, you don't understand the cross. If the cross to you is just something you wear around your neck and you haven't been seriously flat on your face impacted by it, then you don't understand the cross. The cross should throw you on your face and lift you up in value at the same time. It's beautiful. It's incredible. And without it, we have no hope. And that's when Paul says, may I boast in nothing except for the cross of Jesus Christ. As we shift, he goes on and he says, you know, and this is to the people, and they would have understood this, says, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is the fact that you have been made new. I don't care how religious you are. I don't care how much stuff you know. I don't care how smart or how dumb. Any of that and all of that is irrelevant. I don't care how many souls you have won to Christ. Again, you got to hear my heart on that. I am not diminishing evangelism, so don't hear that. I am promoting evangelism when it comes to the gospel of Christ and the cross. If you can't love the person that you're sharing the gospel with, maybe you don't have any business sharing the gospel with them. Because maybe you don't understand the cross either, and you're just looking at somehow maybe God will accept me now. I know, those are rough words to say. And you've got to hear the heart behind it. If you don't love the person, you maybe you don't understand the cross yet. The cross leads you to love people because you understand how much you have been loved. We see that in scriptures as well. So it doesn't make any difference what you've done, what you haven't done. What does matter is that you've been made new by the cross of Christ. And then he says, because when you come to understand the cross of Christ, then peace. I don't have to worry anymore because it's like, Lord, you've saved me. I didn't deserve it. You've done it. I can have peace because I understand the mercy that has been offered to me that I did not deserve. To all who follow this rule, to the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble for I bear on my body the marks of of Jesus. Now, Paul is likely referring to literal the abuse that he received here, but I can't help but envision those fingerprints. As Paul has followed Christ in the gospel, he's like he's got these fingerprints where God has envisioned this. You know how you mold with clay? <clears throat> I don't do this very often. I did it in the eighth grade art class. You know, I made some very wonderful things of pottery that my mom has since gotten rid of. Here, mom, I made you a coffee cup. Went to drink the coffee cup, it all runs down her face. Okay, you just ruined my blouse. But you can't work with clay without leaving some fingerprints on it. And when I look at this, this picture, what matters is that you're a new creation, that God's fingerprints are all over you as he has molded your heart and is molding your heart. Man, may I be covered with the fingerprints of Jesus Christ. Lord, continue to do that molding. I want to be transformed I don't want to be deceived. I don't want to fall into, hey, look at me, I'm so great. I want you to transform my heart, my soul. Use your hands, use your fingerprints. Leave on me the marks of Christ. And finally, grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, excuse me, with your spirit, brothers and sisters, amen. And that is the book of Galatians. If you leave, when you leave, if it's okay, because we couldn't be deceived to think that we're actually going to leave this place. When you leave, oh, if you don't understand the cross, don't leave here today without understanding not only your depravity, but understand the repugnance of the cross as well as the sweetness of the cross. Don't leave. I want you to understand that because that is where we find the gospel and the power of the gospel. That's what leads me to love people and to want to share the gospel with others. 
not as some accolade of my own, but because of what Jesus Christ has done in me, now I want to share that message with others. I'm going to invite Lane. Uh, I want us to reflect and to worship. I want us to reflect on this reality. Do I understand the cross? Do I understand the repugnant nature of the cross? Do I understand the sweetness of the cross? Or am I just like content to like, you know, I'll wear it around my neck and I'm good. Okay, it kind of says that I'm a Christian, but for the most part, I'd like to keep it at a bit of a distance. I don't want to be persecuted by my friends. Oh man, Lord, will you do that transforming work in us? Let us be molded. Allow us to invite you to do that molding work in our hearts and our souls. And I want you to reflect on the cross, but I also want you to worship Jesus Christ who died on that cross for you, who gives you the value that you have because you are more valuable than anyone else you could imagine. There's, you're more valuable than Billy Graham. I should say just as valuable. Okay? That's an incredible picture, not because of what you've done, You're valued because of what Jesus Christ did on that cross. He was willing to do it for you. So I want you to worship him because of what he's done, but reflect on, Lord, am I being deceived? Do I understand this cross? Let the Spirit speak to you this morning. Stand and join me. I searched the world But it couldn't fill me A man's empty praise And treasures that fade Are never enough And you came along And put me back together is now satisfied here in your love oh there's nothing better than you oh there's nothing better than you Lord there's nothing nothing is better I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend, cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. 
I long to follow Jesus, for He has said, of the cross. May you come to understand the beauty and the depth of the cross. May you be covered in the fingerprints of Christ as he transforms your heart into that new creation. May the may your gospel identity be found because of the marks of Christ in your life. Let me pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for this letter that Paul has written to the Galatians. If, if ever there's an applicable letter in my life, I feel like this has been it. I thank you for the cross. And Lord, I pray that your spirit will lead so boldly in our lives that we will know what it is that you're calling us to do and that we will keep in step with your spirit as we follow the truth of the gospel, not in what we think or what we want, but what it is that you have laid out for us. So Lord, thank you for your work on this cross. You are worthy of our worship. You create in us a new creation. You give us the value we are accepted by God, not because of what we have done, but because of what you have done. And then now, Lord, I ask that as you have made us new and you have marked us with your fingerprints, Lord, may we share the love that you have for us that we understand now in the cross, not out of obligation, but out of love for others because of the love that you have for us. Lord, this is for you and your glory alone. You have saved us. We worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you uh, to have some coffee, share some snacks, and some conversation with one another, and have a great Sunday afternoon.